I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. Welcome to the play. No, it's not the playing footsie. It's the midweek footsie podcast. On the Midweek Footsie Podcast, this is designed to be a slightly shorter version of our videos where we answer a question that we get each week. So if you have questions, go over to the normal podcast, watch it all the way through, and then leave us a question and we might answer it (laughs) here. Um, This week's question we've got from Mohammed M. And he asks, when you guys are doing your research on a company, how important is shares outstanding and the company performing share buybacks and the company performing share buybacks over the time is it important for a company to buy back their own shares and he does follow that up afterwards with maybe some hypocrisy that all three of us are starting to show with uh bristol myers squib uh actually actually issuing shares quite a lot of shares over the past two years and uh, you know bristol myers squib is one of our favorite stocks i think all three of us have or do own this at the moment i certainly do and we're all painfully getting punished for it right now uh i'll still be buying as soon but f- just uh for disclosure i'll be buying as soon as i can get some money i'll be buying more bristol myers squib um but yeah let's talk about share buybacks How important are they? What is it? And uh, should we be buying a company if they issue shares? So it depends a little bit on what kind of stage of development the company's at. So I talked about Plug Power sort of several months ago now. It's had massive, massive revenue growth, but it's had even faster uh, growth in shares outstanding, which means its actual revenue per share is down based on um, where it was at a few years ago. But it's kind of fine with that from Plug, right? I mean, a company like Plug that is so young in its development Uh, It needs money in order to get things done, and it's got two ways of getting money. It can either take out debt, which it then has to pay, but it doesn't have any kind of free cash flow to do that with, or it can issue equity, which involves giving away shares, basically. So there are definitely companies where the right thing to do is for them to print shares. If they've got a good use for uh, share printing, and this is nearly always the case with very young growth companies, uh, I don't tend to be massively into those, but I can see that it's a fine thing for them to do. I mean, I wouldn't expect them to be doing share buybacks anytime soon. I would expect them to be trying to issue as few shares as they can, but I would be entirely on side with the fact that they would do it. So I don't view share buybacks as essential or even uh, management not printing shares as uh, essential particularly. But I do think it's about doing it in the right times and the right places. And we might come back to that on Bristol Myers. So I was just going to say that it's really situational. Um, so it's like all things in investing. There's, there's certain metrics that you can chuck away. And um, the issue with Bristol Myers is an interesting one. But I, before we get on to it, I just, I just want to cover the general stuff in that shares outstanding is something that I look at. And yes, like everybody here, I probably like to see that number going down. But it isn't something that I must look at it's not something that if it's not going down that i think right okay i'm not i'm not interested in that and in the same way that if the shares are increasing that again is not something that would immediately make me say oh oh i better i better dodge that one it all depends on the sort of company's life cycle it's a it's one of those hard facts of life that companies need cash for everything so even companies that generate massive amounts of cash sometimes think it's much better to raise in, in the case of Bristol Myers, 60, 70 billion to buy a company uh, via issuing shares than it is to raise debt. And if you were forced with uh, picking the two options in a shareholder meeting, I'm sure you would probably go for the dilution over the debt, especially when it's a, um, you know, you're going to a, a, an area where interest rates could be could be raised and, and maybe uh, Bristol Myers are not getting quite the uh, the coupon sort of like rate that, you know, that, that they, you would expect from them. So, it's an interesting situation. It's not something I particularly look at. It's something I have in the nice to have column. Um, I don't know about you, Paul. Is it is it something you're really you're really dead set on? No, not necessarily. It's um, I think it's important because we have to understand what shares outstanding are actually 
meaning meaning for this uh, meaningful for the shareholder so when you have you're taking your slice of the pie and when some when a company starts to issue shares your slice of that pie gets smaller and it's directly correlated to their earnings so your earnings yield gets smaller when uh they start issuing shares and that's not a good thing for for shareholders and it's it's largely a silent shareholder uh thing for shareholders it's largely a silent killer that not really everybody looks like looks at everyone tends to look at pe ratios or free cash flow or let's say revenue growth and then obviously the story that that big juicy story that people are looking for uh at the moment and i think there needs to be a little bit more education on share buybacks at the moment because people have very specific ideas of it when like you say i think it is situational i think i think it is very very situational I look at tesla diluting their shareholders quite a bit you know t tesla just seems to have a never ending amount of money right now if it wants a new giga gigafactory it just issues five billion worth of shares and it gets its new gigafactory it's it's such a good way of raising capital uh but when you're not making the same revenue growth and possibly the same profit growth as something like Tesla, then, uh, yeah, it can be dodgy. So I think it's something people need to look at and be careful of. And if you are sort of buying a company that's issuing shares like mad, then you need to have a very, have a really good understanding of where that company could be in the future and say, okay, let's say I am basing it on earnings of this company going up by 50% a year over the next 10 years. But if they're also issuing shares at 50% uh, over the next 10 years, I need to realize that my share of those earnings of 10 years are actually halved uh, in a compounding way as well. So yeah, I guess kind of complicated on that. And it is easier for me to just say, oh, maybe I should just buy companies that buy back their shares. And then I don't have to think about the placing into my discounted cash flow. Uh, the effect that shares being issued will have an effect on me. So, yeah, I suppose I would prefer to look at companies that are buying back their shares. But when there is a clear reason why a company is issuing that share that those shares at that rate, then you can justify it. That's how far I would go with it. Bristol Myers Squibb being a really good example of that, then potentially. <laughs> so, I mean. Uh, it yeah, uh, there was a clear reason why they did it. Right. So um, one of the things I guess that we all kind of agree on here is that, look, share issuing is fine if you have a good enough reason or use for the money that you're going to make by issuing the shares. Um, if you can see something like a company like Celgin, uh, which you would like to bring into the Bristol Myers Squibb, um, uh, I guess, conglomerate now, it's basically a wholly owned subsidiary uh, of Bristol Myers Squibb. And you think, look, there's some really good drugs in that pipeline. We could really use those drugs. We can get this at a price that's really attractive. We just haven't got the cash lying around. We need to get it somehow. Um, you can absolutely issue shares uh, to do that kind of thing. Sell them, use the cash to buy it. Or, um, as was the case with the Squibb deal, uh, so Chelgene shareholders got um, one Bristol Myers Squibb share, $50 cash and a CVR, which Steve's going to come back to in a moment. But it depends a little bit when you're trying to make these acquisitions on exactly what your um, acquiring company will take. Uh, some companies want cash, some companies want stock. Um, and if you have a company that really wants your stock in, from Berkshire Hathaway, Bristol Myers Squibb, whoever it is, uh, printing some shares in order to make that deal happen at the right price, uh, that can be a perfectly good way of doing things, I think. Yeah, one of the things I was just going to say is that <clears throat> in doing the Celgene deal, Bristol Myers Squibb essentially um, doubled its revenue. Um, not quite, but um, essentially did. But it didn't double its share count. So straight away, you're there. That that is a pretty good deal for the farmer industry, which is pretty high margin. Uh, definitely on a gross margin basis. Anyway, it's uh, it's pretty decent margin. Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, We've talked about it before, but uh, just be prior to the Celgene merger, they pretty much lost all their ambition of being an independent company. They were really, really looking to be acquired. They brought in Caforio, and he injected a little bit of ambition into the company, and that ambition was uh, was shown by the fact that they were prepared to go out and buy Celgene for what was a sec essentially seventy billion. Um, they didn't end up paying that full amount because of the CVRs, which you know we'll get onto um, a bit later. But um, 
yeah, so, you know, you can't really fault that. If you were looking at just shares outstanding there and you discounted Bristol Myers Squibb because they had a big issue, then you're going to miss out the fact that this company is going to go through what we hope is a spectacular period of growth. Mm. So, um, and obviously that will transition onto the bottom line because it's a high margin business and that's what high margin businesses do. And then those shares will start to come down again. So there will be a period of time when we're probably not too far away from the amount of shares we started with and we'll still have Celgene under our wing and maybe some other big companies, who knows? That'd be nice. It might be a little way off. But Mohammed's dead right. I mean, when you look across mm. the Bristol Myers Squibb shares outstanding from 2015 and you see 1,600-ish, 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 1,700, 2,200, you do want to know what's going on there. You do want to know suddenly why that share count went up. I mean, he's dead right in pointing out that there needs to be a good reason for that. And you as a shareholder need to be at least content um, that those shares are being used for something that's worthwhile or that you're content to accept as worthwhile. And it's not just that at the moment. Anybody who's even a little bit familiar with Bristol Myers Squibb, especially with this uh, year's earnings will know that there's quite a significant uh, lack of earnings this year. Um, and that's all been brought on by, by a pretty bad year in the pharmaceutical industry in general, but also some sort of unusual expense, which um, actually seems to offset uh, because I think they bought myocardia, which is, I think it's about 14, 14 billion of unusual expenses for this year. And it's really thrown their EPS off. Now, it might be a good story to see these things. So you go, OK, uh, myocardia buy, unusual expenses, push down their EPS. So people just looking at their EPS are just going to sell straight out. And then you've got the shares outstanding being issued, you know, printing shares to, to basically go for a deal which fell through uh, but it was kind of a choice that fell through which i'm sure steve d is going to get onto in a minute um but there's an underlying growth of heavy free cash flow growth and i think a three percent revenue growth going on each year and this feels like there's been a bit of a change in the balance sheets that might be confusing a few investors and actually there's a real growth story that's starting to pop out here but we've alluded to this; these uh, CVR um, shares, uh, uh, CVR rights at the moment. Uh, so let's go for it. Steve D, what are we talking about when we're talking about Bristol Myers Squibb and the rights to these pharmaceuticals? So the CVRs are really interesting things in finance. So basically, this is when the acquirer and the seller can't agree on the final bits of the price. So these we're talking about the last few quids here, essentially. Um, so what was agreed in the Bristol Myers deal um, was that um, Bristol Myers would pay the fifty dollars in cash. They would give a share, which at the time was probably worth another fifty dollars in cash. Um, and for those who don't follow Bristol Myers Squid, it's been about fifty dollars since the dawn of time. Um, then what they did is they gave a CDR to all um, all Celgene shareholders for every share that was worth nine dollars on the proviso that the um, three main drugs in Celgene, uh, Celgene's pipeline actually got full FDA approval by the 31st of December of, of last year. Um, so all of those actually didn't make it. They didn't actually get all, all three of those drugs through. So those CBRs um, actually expired completely worthless and freed up about, do you have the figure, Paul? Was it about five billion or was it six billion in cash? Um, I remember it being four billion. Was but it, that's was just it, off memory. Exactly. Thrown back yeah. onto the, it gets thrown back onto the Bristol Myers, um, back onto the Bristol Myers balance sheet. So that is that is interesting. Some of that went to myocardia, but just looking at the stats, this is why we encourage people to not just look at the stats and to go and dig around and find out the truth behind what's actually happening. You would see a company that is essentially a busy fool. They have doubled their revenue and made a, made a, an absolute shit ton of losses. And if you only looked at those two items in, in, in together, you would think, ha, huh, this is crap. But well, what you're seeing is a company with a hell of a lot of ambition, which is why I think it's attracted all three of us here, because I see the growth story and I'm the growth investor here. Steve sees the value play because it's trading at ridiculous value and Paul just likes dividends. So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that, that's that's really the um, the interesting thing for me. I still, I know I'm, I'm with you guys here. If I, if I had uh, a thousand pound left to put in my ISA tomorrow, I would still be going to put at least a portion of that into Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, but it's whether 
I, I've got a feel we're going to be watching this for a while, and then all of a sudden it'll catch on um, because it mm. can't start making the amount of money. Can it? Because I see Bristol Myers as a conglomerate that's only going to keep growing now. I think we're looking at potentially one of the bigger pharma companies, um, pharma companies around, especially with the the cash when that starts transitioning to the bottom of their balance sheet. You are talking about a company here that won't be needing to issue shares anymore because it's going to have so much cash. It's going to be so cash rich. Uh, and, and the pharma industry, as we know, is growth by acquisition. And this company is going to be able to do it pretty straightforward. Um, you know, buy back shares at a, a, a lightning rate, pay down the debt, which is the, the issue that we've highlighted a few times, and also pay Paul a nice dividend. So, um, yeah, I think it's an inter- really interesting And a low payout company. ratio as well. Let's yeah, remember, low and ratio. a low payout ratio, high cash flow generation as well. Um, but I, I'm not Brian Feraldi. I'm not here to tell you all about the positives of a company and ignore all the negatives. There are a couple of negatives that I've recently seen um, in this company. And I don't know if you, you guys have, but I think, I think it's all news. Like I have to prefix this. I'm, I'm trying to find a bad story here because I do want to be as, as balanced as possible. But uh, some of their top drugs are proving to not be as good as we first thought. So, uh, the main story that I've seen recently, which I think has been bringing down the price in the short term. So the two two reasons why the price has been brought down in the short term was the quite poor and negative uh, outlook on the uh, recent 10K, but also Opdivo, which is uh, one of its top drugs right now. It's it's had five years of really good um, efficacy with kidney cancer. It's had really, really, really good. It's been like the winner in, in kidney cancer. It's, it, when combined with another drug, it starts with a Y. I won't even try and butcher this. I'm going to butcher this whole story right now. But uh, Keytruda and uh, the other one, there's another drug that Keytruda is pairing with to fight kidney cancer at, the, at this present time, is actually 72% more effective in the short-term study. And Bristol-Myers had to come out and say... Um, Oh, but we've got five years worth of data now to suggest that we're better than Keytruda and Keytruda's only got a couple of years worth of data. And it feels like they're just kind of fighting with a with a bit of an old story on this. And it's it's making Opdivo look pretty bad. And I think Opdivo is either his second or it's second or third most profitable drug right now. And it's a big it makes up a big part of their big part of their run. So the only, the real risk side that I've got here with Bristol Myers Squibb is that its moat's pretty slim. Its moat's probably non-existent, to be honest with you. And also that the um, yeah, some of their drugs are just getting a bit of a bad rap. And uh, I don't know, that's Steve dropping his Bitcoin there in the background. <laughs> <laughs> just telling Bristol Myers Squibb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so th- uh, that's that's my main bear case. I don't know if you've got anything bear case, but I always try to on on balance. I want to be balanced. No, I think my my, um, my bear case is is obviously is macro in its political mm. led pharma pricing. Yeah, um, that's where mm. I would say its mm-hmm. biggest problem is. I, I don't think there's yeah. there's ever an issue with um, sort of single domination in a, in a field as big as cancer. Um, I think the issue we're going you're going to have there is. There's there's a lot more nuance to it than even even efficacy. I'm afraid it's all it's all about pricing, it's all about the the salesman's ability to get that in the hand of the the doctor. So I'm not particularly worried about that, mainly because as well the Opdivo patent is um, is 2028, so it's not got an awful lot of time left anyway. So Bristol Myers Squibb is a big enough company to have mm. things coming in the background. Uh, there's still all of the cell gene stuff to come through, um, and there's still um, everything Icardia. that comes from Myocardi, which was a, a relatively big a- a acquisition as well. And cell, um, Bristol Myers Group are not stupid; they they've seen something of real value there, and and I'm just waiting for that to play out. Mm. Well, I think uh, that's uh, all we can really do on share share buybacks, share issuing, uh, uh, unless you wanted to really talk about uh, any of the other parts of share buybacks. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've already recorded no, we'll, one podcast we'll, tonight. Yeah, we'll probably do, yeah, that's we'll, that we'll probably leave that for another time. I think we could do a whole episode on actual share buybacks and how useful they are to the the rest of the world and you know how companies kind of buy them back for their own personal gain and things. But uh yeah, we'll probably do a video on that. We might add that to our list. 
Uh, but thank you very much for listening to the playing footsie uh, midweek footsie podcast. <laughs> I mean, it's it's we're twenty minutes in now, so this is supposed to be the short version. I'm sorry, guys, who who sat through that. But uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, send us more questions, and we'll try and discuss uh, whatever you want to discuss. Thank you. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. This the sucker's going up. <laughs>